I'm Philippa Fabry. Welcome to the Show Your Superpower series. Conversations with engineers, entrepreneurs, creatives, founders, scientists, thought leaders, disruptors, and warriors. Here to provide insight into what differently able children can become, given the right environment, teachers, and parenting. Because just asking the right questions and listening to what our children need can turn real challenges into superpowers that can change their world. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Wednesday, 16th of June, and it is Youth Day. And what an amazing opportunity for us to be chatting about dyslexia and our beautiful, beautiful children and their superpowers. Tonight, I'm joined by Darren Clark. Um, he's an, a dyslexia um, advocate and influencer, and we're going to be chatting about his journey through schooling and as he found his superpower um, in the world. And this is an opportunity, guys, to really try and pull your children into this conversation. Um, we, we, we're speaking to the young people today. Um, if you have a child or a family member who is struggling with reading and spelling and writing, and we, we, we're wanting to speak to you. Parents, we're speaking to you. You have the opportunity to bring out your child's superpower. You just need to know where to find it. My name is Philippa Fabri, and tonight we are demystifying the diagnosis. We are looking at um, trying to find the true potential, the gifts, the talents, the, the amazing gifts that our children have been born with. Um, as an education consultant, I've been in this game for 25 odd years. Um, I've walked this journey as a parent. I'm walking this journey as an education consultant. I founded a school in Port Elizabeth uh, 16 years ago called Elson Academy, and we are walking the talk um, about learning barriers, learning challenges, and providing the opportunities for our children to shine, not to survive, but to shine. Um, so when you look up the word superpower in the dictionary, I'm going to read what it says. It's, it refers to a person's particular genius. It is the specific, unique, and specialized skill that they possess. So if I had to ask you what your superpower is, do you have a superpower? Do you know what your superpower is? Have you discovered it yet? Let's just think about that for a while. What is your superpower? Are you using your superpower in your business, in your um Whatever you're doing as an adult, what, whatever problem you are solving, I always say, what, what, not, uh, what, not what you do, but what problem are you trying to solve? Um, so let me know where you're watching from. This is an interactive discussion. Tell me where you're watching from. Uh, if you have a child, let me know what grade. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a parent. We're speaking to you. We're joined live by um, Facebook, YouTube. Um, LinkedIn, some of us are, are, have joined through LinkedIn, but I want to introduce my, my guest um, that we actually bumped into each other in a room in Clubhouse. I'm not too sure how many of you have discovered Clubhouse yet. Um, it was only for um, Apple users, but it is now for Android users as well. And if you haven't been invited to Clubhouse, try and get yourself an invite. It's the most amazing platform for meeting new people. Um, so, Darren, I'm going to bring you up onto stage. Hello, hello. 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 Good hey, evening. Hey, hi, hi. Good evening. Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. And we are, um, I'm looking at that map behind you, and we know we discussed that you are in Bristol, up in the yes. UK. What's the yes. weather like in, in, in where you are? Uh, we're really at blessed the at the moment. Yeah. Um, I it, see. Going through some some kind of heat wave at the moment. Uh, we're, we're incredibly blessed with the with, with the weather, which is very um, very surreal in the UK. But um, really? I, I've been told we've got rain tomorrow, so we'll probably be back to oh. the weather. But, but okay, gorgeous. it looks like you. Yeah, it, 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 I can see you. You're looking summery. You're looking summery, <laughs> unlike me with my long long sleeve shirt and. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's get down to business. So there's some some people watching us. Uh, Katie Mill watching from Port Elizabeth. She's a teacher. We've got Marcel Sharp. Um, hello, welcome. Hi, Miss Marcel. And I saw Marusi. Marusi, I hope I'm saying your name right. Welcome. We are chatting about dyslexia this evening, and the um, I suppose the superpower that might come out of having a. Uh, 
a different ability. We don't call it a disability. We call it a different ability. So Darren, just in a nutshell, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, so I'm uh, I, I'm I have uh, dyslexia and ADHD. So I but I found out very late on in life, at the age of thirty six. I'm forty four now, so I'm still trying to understand and find my own way around uh, dyslexia and and, uh, and my own ADHD kind of diagnosis. So so it's still uh, still very new to me in that sense. Um, I guess you know at thirty six that was quite a late. Uh, late diagnosis, but um, but yeah. So so my my kind of role in the job that I do now um is I kind of work with organisations, and uh, to and ed- and the educational sector to kind of make it more uh, neurodiversity kind of awareness and, and and friendly. And it's something that I've been working on for the past uh, about four years, really, on on a, on kind of a, a global stage. How did you get into that? Say four years ago, what what was the deciding factor? <clears throat> Yeah, so so I kind of uh, I, I've always kind of uh, I start I've been running my own businesses uh, for about ten about twelve years, um, and when I kind of I always worked in the kind of the educational sector in the sense of going I wanted to give back so I wanted to start speaking at schools uh, it was more kind of entrepreneurship business um, and I did kind of assembly talks uh, so you know the. Uh, you know, to, to talk to the kind of the, the, the whole school. And then I would speak to kind of small groups. And I ended up speaking to about 80,000 students over a period of six years. And this was mm. um, secondary school. So uh, in, in the UK, we say, call it the secondary school. Uh, mm. I, I've done, you know, the, the infant school, primary school, youth projects, um, a- anything that kind of helped um, bring more awareness um, around kind of the dyslexia, ADHD, neurodiversity. But it was, um, like I said, it was it was more business to start off with. And then um, once I found out my own kind of diagnosis, I then kind of started to, to share my own story uh, of maybe, you know, some of the struggles I've had and some of the successes. Um, and how I got into it was purely um, I... I uh, I, I researched around dyslexia. I was Googling, trying to kind of absorb and understand it. And it, I, I literally put a an email together to 76 different organizations to do with the IDA, so the International Dyslexia Association. Mm-hmm. And because I wanted to kind of contact organizations that kind of knew a little bit about dyslexia. And I, I just put a, a, a uh, my partner helped me put an email uh, campaign together, put it out um, and it, everything kind of snowballed uh, from them. From putting mm-hmm. that email out, I uh, got in touch with uh, uh, a school in Kenya and Malawi uh, in, in America. So it kind of, I know I'm kind of fast forwarding now, but it, 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 how I got into it is really just kind of reaching out and asking people if I can help and support. But in return, I was learning from them uh, as well. Mm. Wow. So we'll get into we'll get into that because that is very interesting in in terms of how you were received. So how the schools sort of responded to your to your you know to your reaching out to them but take us back to the 10 year old darren clark sitting in a classroom in a school somewhere what yeah, was no, life absolutely. like for you then absolutely so so i guess it was just a, a child that was uh, always a dreamer um always kind of feeling like i just didn't fit in uh to the kind of the the, the establishment of the world that i was kind of in i was always always dreaming always innovating always thinking uh, differently I felt to my peers um so so primary school so my first school from uh, you know up until I went to secondary school I think it was 11 or 12 years old hmm. that that was kind of uh, I, I look back on it in a kind of a joyous way because there wasn't a massive amount of pressure uh in my first school because it was it wasn't loads of exams there wasn't they weren't really kind of testing me but but when I went up to the big school, so to speak, the secondary school, that's when the 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 unknown kind of dyslexia and the ADHD really was kind of tested to to the max. And I was because I was tested so many times in the sense of you know what class you should go in and your exam results and everything else. Um, subsequently, at the time, they didn't really understand what dyslexia was, and of course, I, so there was no diagnosis and there was no. Uh, teacher that can kind of help and support so they would literally just put me uh, in this thing called the unit which was a an old kind of porter cabin um in the middle of a, a school playing field and that's more or less where I spent five years of my my education um with substitute teachers uh just kind of 
uh, doing colour and in books, anything that would keep me kind of occupied. Uh, I was allowed to sit, um, <clears throat> I was allowed to go to drama. Uh, I was allowed to, uh, to do uh, physical education, so PE um, and uh, art. So those were the kind of the three lessons that I was able to go. When mm. they asked me to go, when I tried to go to math, English, humanities, science, I'd go, but because I found the lessons very challenging, uh, they would then pull me out and put me back into uh, into the, the, the classroom, so to speak, which wasn't really a classroom. So I okay, so you're a bit lost. So, so was that affecting all subjects then, not just your language? It was affecting math. It was affecting yep. social science. It was affecting everything. Um, were, were, were you were you struggling in terms of concentration, um, behavior? Yep. So, so I wasn't. Um, so I, I, funny enough, even though I was, uh, you know, separated from my my friends, uh, which is very difficult in in school. You just want to kind of fit in and and just kind of go, you know, mm -hmm. under the radar, so to speak, and not be, you know, to stand out. But it was very difficult because I would go to these lessons, and you know, words were for me. You know, I understand with dyslexia, it's it's on a spectrum, so everyone is is different. But for me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had the visual stress of dyslexia, so you know, words would move around on the screen, um, and I would just feel, uh, you know, kind of at a real loss. And when I'm trying to explain it to people back then, I mean, you know, we're talking school in sort of the 1980s, 1990s, which didn't really have the grasp of neurodiversity and dyslexia as they do now. So, so I I, I did feel. Um, it affected the social side of, of, of me, you know, the confidence. Uh, there were so many elements. And, and it was almost difficult because I was allowed to sit some lessons and not others. So mm. when you were put back into one of the lessons with all of your, your friends, there's, you, you did feel a little bit less confident because they're thinking, well, you know, he's back. And then you get pulled back out and put into a, um, another classroom, so to speak. Mm. And your parents, were they called in for discussions? I mean, was there some kind of a collaboration between the teachers and your parents? Yeah, I, I, I think you know, my, my parents absolutely, you know, loved them, to, loved them to pieces. And I guess it was just a different era um, back then. And, and the school that I went to was quite a uh, notoriously kind of kind of a um, you know, a, a very large school, uh, and it it, it was uh, I call it the kind of the school of hard knocks. Um, and and I don't think there was. Um, I mean, there must have been parents' evenings, and there must have been you know talk about it. But I kept a lot of it to myself, um, and that was my own decision. Um, so I would make out that everything's kind of going going well, and obviously uh, it, it wasn't. Um, but there was never this moment where they would pull my parents in and, and look at my grades. It was almost, it, looking back on it, it was almost, well, he's not really achieving this. That's fine. We've got, you know, better things to kind of uh, mm. to, to spend our time on, sadly. Mm. So you were pulled out and then allowed or integrated in for certain lessons. Yes. Once you then moved on to high school, um, then how were you accommodated there yeah so so high school um was the, the the school that the secondary school that i was kind of um pulled out of of uh of these lessons so in 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 okay. in uk we have the we call it primary school and secondary school so primary school you have nursery primary so primary goes up to i think it's uh, about 10 or 11 uh about 11 12 years old and then you then go into the thing called secondary school and then uh, that can go up to kind of 17 18 and then college university so right. the, the the high school which was equivalent for us is the secondary school was where I was uh, taken out of lessons and, and um, you know put back in oh wow and then exams how did you yeah, so, sit your yeah yeah so um so I wasn't actually allowed to sit any exams um they uh, they, they use the terminology that it would be a waste of paper um to to allow me to sit uh, the exams um so so subsequently when everyone was taking exams i was again in a in, in a separate classroom doing coloring in or anything to kind of keep me uh occupied um so to speak so so yes i left school with uh with no qualifications because they, they wouldn't let me sit uh, any exams how do you rise above that? 
I mean, without that taking its toll on your on your self esteem, on your emotional well being, how do you how do you go forward then? So so you leave school with without a, a qualification, and then yeah, so so it does play, and I guess you know the the damage that that's actually done on um you know on your confidence or your mental health mm -hmm. or you know all these kind of elements that it doesn't never really completely go away because you, you you know there are elements that you have to kind of work on you know work on yourself so so I guess for me uh I've always had this positive mindset and whether it's dyslexia whether it's ADHD whether it's just me I, I don't know I tend to always try and look on um, you know, same as my parents, I always try and look on the more positive side of things. And I, I just knew that, you know, I was very entrepreneurial. I was, I, I still love doing things outside of school. But it, so I, I knew once I was able to do something that someone would give me the opportunity for, that I could kind of fall in love with and, and start doing, um, then then I knew I could kind of excel. But it, it, it was really tough, you know, leaving school with um, not being able to read you know, in, you know, hardly be able to read. Uh, writing was 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 tricky. I, um, you know, getting a, a, a job was difficult. I applied for twenty six um, jobs uh, after uh, I left school. I was just cycling around uh, on my my BMX, uh, so my bike, cycling around the area, going into shops, going into um, to banks. So I even applied to go into a funeral parlor, any shop or any business asking if they would take me on. And um, subsequently, as soon as it got to the application process and you had to fill in where the grades were, I would always leave that blank because there was no grades to put in there. My mum would help me uh, fill in this application form. Um, and it was this this one moment, and I think this is where dyslexia thinking can think outside the box sometimes. Um, and I always remember I was going into a, a food retailer, which is very big in the UK, and I had my application form. And just as I went in to do the same process I've gone in for the past 27 times into different stores, I remember looking at that box and seeing it empty. And I was thinking, well, you know, is this box, is this what's stopping me from getting an interview? And I always remember, and I'm not condoning lying on any CV or anything else like this. I'm just saying. So, so for me, I remember taking that um, application form, sitting down on the on on uh, on the floor in in the middle of a car park, and thinking to myself, well, what grades would I have got had I had sat some exams? So I remember just filling in these uh, these exam results, not giving myself A's or B's, <laughs> um, you know, good grades. And I mean, and I, I filled it in, and I got. You know, I got through the door and, and got an interview. Um, so I'm, so I don't know whether that helped or whether that stopped. But this was for about twelve hours a week pushing trolleys in a in a supermarket. Mm. So it wasn't, you know, um, a graduate program or apprenticeship or anything. It was a supermarket, which was great. But that was my first kind of real success, I guess. Mm, mm. Um, okay, let's look at some questions before we go on to the second part. So um, I'm sure you buried many issues as it would have been easier how did it impact on your adulthood yeah so i i um i completely agree uh, i think we all kind of bury um some form of issues for me Push, uh I'm, yeah, yeah i've been pushed I, I i have suppressed so many you know so many times over my, over my life um but i you know i actively um meditate I actually speak about my feelings i you know i've spoken um to you know to people over over the years about these things um and that that helps me kind of express and, and mm. get some of these things um some, some of these things mm. out there's a good question what would be the most important thing to know about dyslexia in order to help the potential child what's the most important thing because okay firstly we know that it's on a spectrum so you get mild severe we also know that dyslexia can affect different things that some kids are, are, are dyslexic and they spell brilliantly, but they cannot read. Um, some children speak brilliantly. You think that there's no way that they could have a learning barrier because they're so, um, um, what's the word, eloquent, but yet they can't, they can't write as well as they can speak. So I suppose looking back, what is the, I suppose, what is the common factor, you know, I that links all the different types of dyslexia together? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, for, for me, I'm not um, a specialist in dyslexia. It's for, for you know, I, I talk of kind of personal uh, experiences, uh, of, you know, lived experience. But but all I can kind of, you know, the, the, the schools and the education side of that I've, I've spoken to. 
and, and the parents I've spoken to. And I think it just comes down to understanding the child and speaking to the child and understanding how they see their own kind of dyslexia. Um, because again, everything can kind of be different. And once you can kind of open up that conversation and know what kind of support, and, and I guess sometimes we don't really know what support we actually need. You know, if we went into an organization and said we had dyslexia, the th first thing they would say is, yeah, you know, well, what support do you need? And it depends on how much of the journey that you are on and how much you you know about things. So sometimes it's 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 something that you can kind of just open the conversation with, um, mm. and then it kind of it's that's just again my my personal experience. Mm. I know back in the day they would say that dyslexia is a word blindness, so it it affects the written word, whether yes. it's it's you know r r um, writing yourself reading. Um, spelling, it, it's definitely something to do with the arrangement of the letters, identifying the different sounds in the words. Um, yeah. It's that code that doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. It's just like it's Greek, you know. Um, here's another question about differentiating between a child that could be dyslexic or if they just lack consistency when it comes to learning the phonetics and the reading. Yeah, I think consistency when it comes to learning the phonics and 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 reading there again you know if they if they learn for the test now kids get to write spelling tests that's how they you know they 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 learn their phonics is they have the sounds they have the list and the, the words and then at the end of the week they write a test um but then test them those same words the next day or the next week and they're gone they, they haven't established you know, they're, they're not banked in the brain. They just sort of learn them for that day and then it's gone. Um, and that's, I think, where you would see that inconsistency, where they know it the one day, but they don't know it the next. Um, definitely relate to that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you would agree with that. No, I, um, I can definitely relate to that. There, there, are, there yeah. are certain key words that I continuously uh, spell uh incorrect i then search i because you think about the brain how we learn things if we spend so much time learning something like a musical instrument or you know different pattern we should be able to theoretically be able to kind of lock it in uh but but you know it's time after time after time there's certain words that i would try and write that would just mm. be and i just mm. go through the same process every single time mm. Mm. did the school authorities ever think of testing you orally me personally, yeah. um, I, I never knew anyone. Um, I didn't. Ha I, I actually didn't really um, know of dyslexia um, until mm. I was like thirty six. Um, so it was. It was not, the word didn't kind of exist in in my kind of uh, vocabulary, so to speak. And I didn't ever ever know mm. it you know, of it being spoken to at school. So um, mm. in hindsight, it would have been amazing if I would have known someone or someone would have. Uh, you know, there, mm. there wasn't. This, like you think about schools now, there are, you know, you know, kind of special ed teachers and they can kind of help, um, you know, children. And they, if a child was leaving a classroom and going off to this thing called the unit, it was because they would be labeled, and I, I hate the terminology, troubled children. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the label that I was given. So subsequently, you were then put in with seven or eight children in a kind of, in a classroom. And every, each one of those could be neurodiversity, could be, you know so many different things um but there was never really any time taken um to understand how you can help uh, that individual mm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i think of all the sort of accommodations and the concessions that children are exposed to now that they have available now which is amazing um, and i think yeah. it's due to people becoming more aware and and having that conversation having this conversation and saying listen what is the thing that if we had to level the playing field you know what 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 do you need so that you know you're 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 being treated the same as as everybody else to be fair you know what is the one thing that you need and if it is an oral exam or if it is being able to have your exam written for you where you're just talking the answers and somebody's writing it for you i mean it's it's chalk and cheese really but I think yeah. that is just that is just the the advantage of where we are now, um, twenty years down the line, um, where where you know it, dyslexia is something that is now thrown around a lot. So we've we've also got to be very careful that everybody you know anybody who might struggle with something. So no, well I'm dyslexic, you know. Well you know have you got an official diagnosis? No, no. I just I just you know. Well you know it 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 again it comes down to is that is the label necessary? 
or is it just the fact that you struggle with certain things and you and you require certain accommodations um because darren you say you you were almost um were you the daydreamy type of adhd not the hyperactive yeah. adhd so, so i i i guess a, a bit of both and i know that's um counterintuitive to, to the answer of what, what you know what, what you're saying so so i've always been a, a dreamer i've always been someone who would imagine things and see um you know kind of in, in you know everything in pictures i see everything in pictures and i always think of kind of different ways to you know to do things my adhd yes. i guess i um the, the thing that troubles me with i say troubles me with the adhd is is the the lack of trying to stop my brain from racing um mm. and, and you know when i uh go to sleep at night that that try and switch off um my, my brain can be really really taxing which can then turn into burnout which can be you know become very exhausting um mm. but but so it can kind of go up and down up and down um mm. in, in in those aspects so so you know the, and there's certain things that can trigger it um you know hyper so you have a hyperactive brain not necessarily yeah. a hyperactive body yeah so so i i keep you know i i, I like to keep fit and, and be very active um but mm. my mind just feels like it's running uh mm. all the time and you know i i i do you know meditation um the minute i can kind of get to, to do meditation i know how uh it, it helps me um mm. but to get my mindset to try and understand that i'm going to be doing meditation can be a massive fight because it's almost like my brain saying i don't want to slow you down mm. uh, I don't, you know, so so that could be it but but mm. meditation and listening to classical music um mm. those those things really kind of help so, um mm. you know and nature as well helps kind of slow mm. that that brain down 100%. yeah 100 percent. so when I look or when you look back, what was the thing that you would gravitate towards as a kid where time would stop still and you would go into flow or you'd be in your happy place or you what is the thing that you used to do as a kid? Yeah, so, so I'm uh, I, building things and, and even now, um, I mean, I would I, I loved taking apart things and putting it back, anything that can kind of focus. I love the fact of the idea of living in, when they say living in the moment, but really living in the moment, you know, like, um, so so I would, you know, build uh, dens, you know, like have, out of wood and, and, and take things apart and just to see how they work. I'm a, um, and I've always been uh, into photography. So I, I love mm -hmm. taking pictures. And as a, as a child, my, my, my dad had a, a really old kind of camera, which you'd, you know, you'd have to kind of, um, wait for it to be developed but but that moment um even now it helps when i when i'm looking into an actual camera and i'm looking into the lens and i go to take that shot that moment that i'm there i'm not looking at my phone i'm not thinking about social media i'm not thinking about anything all i'm thinking about is just capturing that moment mm. i take a, a lot of pictures of uh, amateur ph photographer for wildlife so i take a certain picture where the animal or is just about to do something so it could be a bird just about to fly it could be a squirrel just about to jump so those as a child i've always been interested in living in the moment and those photography taking things apart um seeing how mm. it works has always it's always really interested me okay so would you say that is your superpower is taking things apart <laughs> and getting getting I, down to the nitty-gritty of how it works I, I'd say with the, with the superpower thing, I would I would have to kind of say that it it in the biggest thing for me is is communication because I I struggle some you know sometimes sometimes to actually put written communication down. I've always found um, speaking to people and meeting people and uh, is is really kind of connecting with people has become a superpower because. I haven't been able to do a lot of the, you know, if I wanted to grow the businesses, then my partner would help me, you know, with this and she would bring, you know, an incredible set of skills. When I was in corporate management and I was in very senior management, I'd always gravitate to around people. And what I didn't know at the time because of undiagnosed dyslexia is that I was finding my kind of my support group of people without looking for my support group. I mm -hmm. So I've always been like trying to to connect with people and understand and i'm a, a massive believer in in the you know that's one of my superpowers is that i i love speaking to people i love finding out about their stories and connecting with people and that's 
that's really helped me um, mm. in the positions that I've been, you know, my social side of my life, my uh, business life. That's that's really helped. Mm. How are your interest? It's wonderful to hear about your interest in photography and the calming effect it has on you when involved in it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, so, it's so you go out into nature and you take photos of of nature and animals. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I I love um, anything to do with nature. So it's, if it's sunsets, if it's um, mm. anything wildlife uh, side of it, I, I I capture that moment. And I, I used mm. to do it um, a lot of the time off of my uh, off of my phone. But what I found with my phone is that the minute I have it, I have that mindset that my phone is because I you know I, I work a lot like anyone like everyone else. I see that as a working tool. Um, but with the camera, it's, once I've got that in the hand and I'm looking through that that lens, it, mm. it's like time stands still, um, mm. and it's it's just yeah, it's 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 beautiful. It's a beautiful mm. moment. Yeah, it's it's about it, it, the need to exercise patience. As an adult, you have no doubt you ha, you no doubt have trained yourself to control your brain to calm down. I suppose when you're waiting for that exact moment to to take that shot, you yeah, have to it, wait. It, it absolutely there, there's no other because i uh, again i i just kind of visualize so say for instance if it's a, if it's a, a, a bird or a duck or something and it's in the water and i know the pattern of how it would fly and what it would look mm. like so in my head i'm visualizing if i wait and and take that picture then the wing would be there and then the wing would be there and the wing would be there Amazing. and i and and then i take about 30 shots and then within that I would capture the shot that I wanted and and I would I would just stand there and you know looking at the the picture and and it's it's euphoria it's it's just a, it's a feeling of you know feeling proud and and you know and again you don't get every single shot that you you visualize it's that's natural mm. but within that moment mm. there's no phone calls there's no anything else it's just um and, and again yeah I train my brain to think when I going going out with a camera that's mm. that's what I'm going out for, for for an hour of kind of escapism. Mm, beautiful. So let's go back to obviously your first job, and you know you said I mean you've you've won awards, you've you know you're an entrepreneur. Let's talk about some of your businesses and and how you've gotten to where you are now. Yeah, no, absolutely. So so I, I left school with no qualifications. So. My first job was working for a supermarket, uh, pushing trolleys. Uh, so I was collecting the trolleys and put them back. Um, that was 12 hours a week. So it wasn't a full time position. Uh, and then I kind of I fell in love with retail in the sense that because I knew I wasn't there wasn't kind of exams. It was done on sort of physical kind of grafting and, and being able to kind of I knew the process. So the process was if the trolleys are over there and they need to be fit, uh, put back, that's, you know, that was quite simple for me. Um, and so I did that. And then I kind of progressed and I kept asking uh, for more hours and more positions. Uh, and then I subsequently then managed to kind of work my way into the store, working on tills, working on different prop departments. And then kind of fast forward, really, uh, most of my career has been in, in retail. Uh, I, I struggled getting into kind of the managerial positions um early on because again it had you had to have some sort of qualifications to apply for even though i was doing a lot of the managerial roles uh they still wouldn't give you the kind of the the, the managerial role because you had to sit an interview and you had to have a certain qualifications and and i kind of um jumped ship uh, and I went to a different retailer and again I'm not advocating uh, lying on your CV uh, or, or anything but when I went to a different supermarket all I said was that I was a manager at a different sup supermarket um, and they never kind of checked that even though I was doing the managerial role I wasn't officially given the title so mm. I technically it wasn't really a lie it was kind of just saying that so they gave me my first managerial uh, job at supermarket and then it kind of excelled so I, mm. uh, I I excelled in one of the retailers. Uh, I became a, a store manager and then a regional manager and a senior manager. And I was looking after about um, 56 uh, stores at one point, which was, oh. and this was all with undiagnosed dyslexia and, and ADHD. So I was doing about 90, 95 hours a week. Uh, I was traveling all over the place. Mm. Uh, the, mm. the, the pressure uh, that was on me uh, was was intense 
Mm. Um, but I kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion because I just kept pushing myself and pushing myself. Uh, and and prove and and don't get me wrong, there was a lot of times where I didn't get the promotion, and uh, mm. you know, so it wasn't just always going up. There was a lot of kind of downs and um, you know, burnouts uh, in in that sense, but. So, yeah, so I, I got to kind of quite a, a senior position in, in retail over the years. And then I couldn't get any further because the next roll up definitely needed um, some some qualifications, some degrees. Um, mm. So I ended up kind of leaving that uh, behind. And then I started my own business, which was a, a cleaning business. Um, and at the time, a lot of people, my friends and family, they thought I was kind of going through, uh, uh, you know, a, a midlife crisis. Midlife or crisis. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of insane because I left this very well-paid, secure job. Cushy, uh, corporate, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, d- doing this, share a scheme, holidays and everything else like this, you know, when I think mm, back now. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, um, it, you know, I left that to kind of start my own business. And the thing is, I've always gone in at entry level within any mm. position that I've gone in. I've gone in at entry level. So I knew if I put the hard work in and learned the system and learned how mm. to do it, I could grow. So starting my own business, um, you know, was, I knew nothing about cleaning. I just knew it, mm. it was a subscription type business. If I signed a customer up on a weekly clean, then, and I continue to give great service, they'll continue to pay me on a weekly basis. And then it kind of, mm. it just, it just grew there. So we, yeah, so then we set up a, a couple of different cleaning businesses. We grew it to one of the biggest um, in, in the Southwest. Um, we were cleaning about a thousand homes a week on the home cleaning business and mm. over the years we employed you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members of staff um you know off the back of that that's kind of a, a bit of a, a fast forward in that was my mm. kind of first step into you know into my own businesses did you franchise that no we didn't it was always the goal to, to franchise um but i think you know the first two and a half years of that business myself and my partner were out cleaning uh more or less every single day um mm. you know home cleaning we we would have our own cleaning round and then we would get people to we'd hire people and then they would start cleaning and then we'd have staff turn you know uh labor mm. over and people would leave and then it would leave us with you know 15 customers that we'd have to clean for mm, and then, mm. so getting that to grow was really really tricky um and i think we just kind of grew that and then we grew a, a, an office cleaning business and I think after kind of eight, nine, nine years, we, you know, we had managers and supervisors. I think we kind of just fell out of love with the, you know, with the industry and the, you know, the cleaning side of it. But it was very, very successful. It was very, um, very hard work. I learned so much mm. about business um, mm. but, um, that side of it. But no, no, we didn't. We didn't end up franchising that. Mm. And as you say, relationships. If you, if you, you know you're okay with communicating with people and you love people and meeting new people, you know, it, it's about you. People will buy into you, not necessarily your business. They trust you. They know, like, and trust you. Um, and then the business obviously benefits. Um, has anything helped you along the way to be able to gather the information from the forms and documents you would have to work through as you progressed in your career? Yeah. So, so for me, again, you know, my, my, my partner, um, she's been, you know, absolutely incredible. Half, half the stuff that I've done, I wouldn't be able to do without it. So, so that's been my, you know, uh, uh, my biggest support um, network. There are, again, you know, there are, you know, assistive technologies uh, around, uh, you, mm. you know, that's kind of helped as well. But, but yeah, I mean, generally, it's kind of the support network. Um, and, you know, my partner, that's kind of uh, mm. helped around that. So, so I, I can't, you know, I, I'm incredibly blessed to, have to, you know, to be able to have that. Um, so I was going to say, how are you with admin? Uh, admins, <laughs> it's not admin and in, in timekeeping, and in, in is is not my uh, strongest. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'll be completely honest. Uh, you know, I have a, yeah. a, a, I've had diaries for years, and um, each year I look back on them, and, and most of them are empty, even mm-hmm. though I live, you know, very very you know busy life, and there's lots of appointments and things. So the, mm-hmm. the admin side has been, yeah, it's, it's something I. I I've struggled with. Well, you touched on it briefly. You said um, you, you you were talking about what your assistive technology or you have, um, you didn't use a diary, but w- what tools and strategies do you use today that have benefited you? Besides yeah, my, your partner. 
She doesn't come into this one. <laughs> no, 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 she's she's not an assist, assistive technology. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. Um, my, my phone has been, uh, yeah. you know, the, the lifelong uh, for me. Again, um, you know, voice recognition is, is you mm. know, a lot of the time when I'm, uh, you know, I, I take LinkedIn, for instance. I, I tend to get now probably anything from four, uh, 30 to 50 messages a day via LinkedIn. Mm. And it could be an inquiry. It could be something to do with, um, the, the you know the shows that we do or anything else like, like this, so, so it's very difficult sometimes when you're you're feeling quite burnt out by reading mm. uh, to get mm-hmm. back to people. So, so so I tend to reply a lot of the time with voice, um, mm. whether it's a, um, a WhatsApp, LinkedIn, or anything else. So, so that's kind of um, you know really kind of helped me mm. um, on those those side of it. Um, and mm. and again, you know, a, a lot of people tend to use uh software um i'm a little bit kind of old school um i guess so mm-hmm. sometimes I, I tend to rebel against using these things which is really counterintuitive to to helping because i know that it would really help me but sometimes I, I can be a little bit stubborn if i if i'm honest of trying to learn a new software mm-hmm. to kind of help yeah. me in the in the mm-hmm. long run but um you know the, the diary on my my phone um the reminders, voice recognition, um, as as being um, recording, has been absolutely imp- imperative to, to everything that I do. Mm. Drag and speak, I think, is one that's commonly used, um, but it, it's yeah. so complex to actually understand how to use it that it, it I, often doesn't get used. Yeah, there, there's Dragon, there's thing called uh, Claro software. There's 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 mm. an abundance. I mean, I'm very fortunate in in what I do is that I I do get a, a lot of companies. Um, sending me things to kind of trial and, and either review mm. or you know, or, or to, you know to have a have a look at, um, but but I guess I find it very difficult with things that um, are are speaking to me while I'm trying to write or trying to do trying to assist and um, mm. that that kind of really kind of I don't work well with that with with that it's almost like mm. a dictation side of it so yeah but, but we're all, you know we're all different we all we all do things a little bit different have you heard of that scanning pen yes that scans along the line and then it 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 tells you what what is written yeah yeah i've actually seen that work i have i've just heard i've heard about yeah, it I'm good, good friends with the, the, the founder uh the co-founder of that uh, a gentleman called jack churchill who uh mm-hmm who um, founded the business with his business partner, Toby. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're incredibly uh, uh, successful business and they, they, you know, they, they've got in the educational sector and also um, in the workplace now. So, um, mm. but yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, they, they do free trials and everything else. So I'm not mm. um, associated with the company in any way, shape or form, but, uh, but yeah, they, they are, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're good technology. Yeah, the the only sad thing is that generally cell phones and and those kind of tools are not are not really found in schools or, or you know no. I know we're not if you, if your phone is seen you know it gets confiscated and you can come and collect it from the principal's office at the end of the term, um, but it, it you know if those tools were more readily available and if teachers knew more about how to use technologies in the classroom I think we'd be a lot further down the line. Um, then rather taking those sort of things away. Yeah, we I, I work with quite a few uh, tech companies, and and that's one of the things that um, I kind of help uh, around. You know, speaking to them about what assistive technology is out there to kind of help. Uh, you know, to bring into the schools. And in, in the UK, mm-hmm. we're we're very fortunate in the UK that a lot of schools um, are are you know taking upon them and and using some of the technology that that's out there. But like I said, it, there mm-hmm. are a lot lot more work to be done. Mm. Thanks, Darren, for sharing your story as I can relate so much to some of the learners I have had in my teaching experience. Let's go back. What what would you say to yourself? If you had to look back, what advice would you give your 10-year-old self? Yeah, I, I, I would just, you know, just... I, just just telling you know that 10 year old self of mine to just, just you know believe in yourself and just keep going and and just you know don't feel ashamed uh don't feel you know and just keep keep thinking of the you know the, the bigger picture and, and and your goals really it's just I, I do you know I, I've, I've written you know blogs about this and, and and posts about you know speaking to your younger self and and mm. you know I, I think you know, it, it's a very emotional time. I, I guess, you know, I probably speak about it, 
you know, not as emotional as I probably could um, about, you know, that that kind of time. Um, but looking back on it, it was, yeah, it was, a, it was, it was a, if you think 10 years old, just about to go to the big school, that was, you know, mm. that was a tough, you know, six, five, six years. That was a really tough, mm. tough time. So mm. I think it's that having that, that self-belief and, and, you know, that, that kind of inner confidence, I guess. Mm. Did you, did you think that there was something, because a lot of the kids say, you know, I, there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Why I, am I, I so stupid? I, Those sort of, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I just remember going home from school exhausted most days with migraines and headaches and and really just I, I remember speaking out loud on on the way home from school I can remember you know exactly most days I'd go past and and I'd say to myself you know why don't I get it I just don't mm -hmm. get it I you know and I'm, I'm saying to myself I just you know why don't I get it you know everyone else in the class when I'm allowed to sit in these classrooms and everything else the teacher says something it's up on the board they're writing it down it's done and I'm just there thinking you know why don't I get it Mm. you know and 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 that yeah that that really kind of stemmed with me from school into the workplace um it's only kind of now that I still you know I know about my own kind of diagnosis that I can kind mm. of give myself a little bit of a break um you know from it but but yeah that's 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 been with me for many many years that that, that element mm. of not getting it do you think it's very common that adults are only finding out that they had a specific uh, disability later on in life? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know? I, I, I think the, the, the oldest gentleman that I, um, I say, gen that's, you know, someone that connected with me uh, via a social media channel, a gentleman who was 76 years old and mm. listened to some of the, the stories that I put out, some of the posts um, and actually got himself diagnosed you know uh through through some you know uh, um, an organization and that that's the oldest that i know of someone having a diagnosis at 76 and i guess i'm speaking to more more and more people who are now getting diagnosed um and mm -hmm. understanding more about the dyslexia and and it does feel you know i always remember when i was diagnosed it was almost like there's your diagnosis yes there is some form of aftercare um within that but it was almost like a self-discovery of going, okay, so now I've got this diagnosis. What do I do with it now? You know, and, and mm. that, that's where I had to then kind of research myself and try and understand what that meant. And then what I found is then you start kind of having those kind of like flashback moments where you think, ah, well, that made sense when I had burnout at the, mm. uh, you know, the promotional meeting that I had, or I didn't get that, or I didn't do this. And, and all these kind of flashbacks, for me, all these flashbacks kind of happened. Uh, mm. And they kind of, um, yeah, because, you, you know, I I was very hard on myself um, in, in the sense because I didn't know, I always felt there was something there that I just, maybe I wasn't clever enough, or maybe I just didn't get it. And I just needed to push even harder to, to kind of mm. break through, so to speak. Hmm. It's like putting together the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle of, of what what the pieces are that makes you who you are. Yeah. So when who did you go to for your diagnosis? Was it a psychiatrist, a yeah, psychologist, so it, or who? Yeah, it was just a, a, an a, like a, a, an organisation in in Bristol in England um, that were okay. doing um, uh, dyslexia. When well, it was neurodiversity kind of, um, yeah. so I, I went there and had um, a. I had two two appointments and I had a they, once they did the the dyslexia and then there was uh, they thought there was kind of because uh, we know with dyslexia that sometimes it's not just dyslexia it could be um, mm. dyspeculia it could be ADHD could there it could branch out into not for everyone mm. um, but but mm, there mm. are you know traits that there could be some morbidities yeah yes so so mm. they weren't too sure about the ADHD um, but after after being there for, you know. Uh, going for a, a couple of appointments and, and the tests they had, um, they, they said they come out with dyslexia and ADHD, very strong, um, severe dyslexia. Um, mm. and, and I guess I just heard dyslexia, uh, and it's only been probably the last year that I've really kind of started to kind of understand ADHD um, mm. by speaking to people, because I always kind of thought, okay, dyslexia, let's learn about that, rather than trying to learn mm. about dyslexia and ADHD uh, at mm. the same time. Mm. 
did you were you prescribed any medication or, or there, any there treatment? Was, no, I, I, I wasn't. Um, there was uh, talk of it, um, mm. but but personally for me, I I I, I haven't um, you know gone down that route, so I haven't got uh, any mm. experiences of, of, mm. of that. Mm. Yeah, it's it's definitely if you're managing it and it's not affecting your your life in any way, then I think your your ADHD is probably the thing that keeps driving you forward. It gives you that that energy and that hyper focus. Yes, that hyper focus that you need when you are doing your photography. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the, the hyper focus can be uh, can be fantastic when I'm working on a project, or I'm mm. you know I'm do, you know doing businesses or anything else, and it can be you know bad, not bad, but it can be damaging, I guess, in some other aspects that you can forget mm. appointments or anything else that's mm-hmm. kind of going on around you. So, but but mm. it. it the hyper focus. I mean, I don't know if anyone else can can uh, you know mm. share what what that, that that's happened to them. But for for me, I can work on a project, um, and and all I think about is that that one project, mm. nothing else. I'm I'm thinking it needs to be this, it needs mm. to be that, and it's so um, you know I could I could be on it for Consuming. hours and, and forget yeah. about eating and, and drinking yeah. and just yeah, it's it's like you're just tuned into the kind of the matrix side of it, and you just don't want to you, you yeah. can't kind of move. Yeah. Sometimes you just need somebody to say, Oi, hello. <laughs> come on. Yeah. Come and eat yeah. now. Come to bed now. Yeah. yeah. I, I almost and, and, and this is where I, I can see kind of relationships can can struggle mm. uh, and, and you know conversations and stuff. Because because when I'm in a kind of a, a hyper focused state or I'm I'm working on something, it it's incredible. You know, my, my partner's in, in, incredibly understanding in, in the sense that it's almost like, you know, when you kind of tell a child, you know, 10 minutes before bed and then mm. they got that kind of wind down time. For mm. me, it's it's kind of, OK, you know, 20 minutes we're doing this. And in in my head, I can kind of work that out. I'm thinking, OK, so I've now got a bit of a time limit of, of working on something. And then that kind of brings me out of that that kind of mm. state so that that mm. helps um yeah you know, not every time you know sometimes you just need to down tools and go i'm not saying mm. you always get mm. that but sometimes that's really kind of helped um mm. Mm. and what it also has helped is that when i'm going into kind of a mode where i'm kind of coming down and i'm finishing what i'm doing when i go away i'm not necessarily thinking about that if i'm stopped abruptly um and down tools or something whatever mm. i'm going off to do all i'm still thinking about is is it's that. coming back mm. yeah so as we end off, Darren, what advice would you have for any parents who possibly are watching? We've, we've, we're very blessed to have parents and teachers. Um, but maybe from, you know, from a parent's point of view, what advice would you give to them if their child is struggling with, with they don't know what it is, they don't know that it is dyslexia, but they could be struggling? Um, what, what sort of I suppose, yeah. strategies or advice would you give? I, I guess you know, and I've, I've said this before. It's really a case of just starting the, that kind of starting that conversation, because a, a lot of the times we don't, you know, as parents, we don't have all the answers, uh, you, you know, for this. And again, you know, if you're speaking to the, your, your child, it could be that it could be they don't really know what's going on as well. So it's almost, um, you know, I'm always a big believer of, 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 of parents if they feel that element. There are some incredible uh, Facebook groups, and there's incredible people mm-hmm. that you can kind of reach out to to get some kind of you know communities to get kind of some information but it's almost you know not being initially too worried about this but we you know if if, uh, you go to a school and they say well actually we think your child is dyslexic then you think oh my goodness this is going to be you know the end of the world but but there are there are it's just having those conversations and and just kind of building on it gradually and kind of learning and understanding together um and, and reaching out to organizations uh, um, and, and you know other parents and other communities mm. and, and I, I guess it's it, a lot of it is kind of self-educated um, in, mm. in, in, in that aspect but also taking the child um, you know uh, along with you for, for you know for the journey I hope that kind of helps but it is it's mm. not a as soon as you've got the answer that's the kind of the fix this is a you know yeah it doesn't just end long, there this is um, a long journey you mentioned the International Dyslexia Association is that the IDA so yeah, the IDA. So they're they're you know I'm a, a global partner for the IDA, and they they right. the reason I say that is because again you know they do help. Um, they look at 
uh, dyslexia on an international, uh, you know, on a global uh, scale. And they're, they're a great organization to to get involved with because then they'll be able to kind of signpost you to someone within your country. And then it kind of, if you think of it as a global scale and then they break it mm-hmm. down to a country and a district. And then, um, so, so yeah, so they're a, they're, they're a great uh, organization to, to. I'd love to know what the stats are at the moment um, for dyslexia. I don't know if you have those, but I, I was have... looking at, yeah, I was looking at just learning barriers or learning disabilities in general. It's about one in five yeah, they, um, they speak... children. But... So, so on, on a, if you look at neurodiversity as a, as a whole, because I just did a, um, a, 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 a some work with uh, HSBC and this um, we worked out on a neurodiverse level on a global scale it's one in seven that one mm-hmm. in seven people have uh, are there's a neurodiverse um, condition mm-hmm. globally so you, you know mm-hmm. if you then break that down you think of neurodiversity as a whole you know mm-hmm. um, dyslexia dyscalculia, dyscalculia dys, you know it's you know mm-hmm. that we're talking huge numbers of of, of people um, yeah you know and again with, with dyslexia as well so i think again it if we say you know one in five with dyslexia but then that's you know we're taking the number of people that actually know that mm. they have dyslexia so sure. you know and if they did the status statistics you know 20 years ago it would have been a lot lower you know you think how many mm. more people are kind of understanding dyslexia? 36 for me uh so yeah. so i guess it's yeah it, it's growing all the time mm. so we've put your your um your website up there where else can people um sort of learn more about about your neurodiversity stories yeah so so we run a um uh, uh so every friday uh we run a thing called i created a thing called neurodiversity stories where we uh we have uh guests come on similar to this we just have a, a conversation and people just share their kind of experiences around neurodiversity it could be autism could be dyslexia could be anything around kind of the neurodiverse element mm-hmm. uh we, we and we stream that out uh on uh linkedin uh live and mm-hmm. facebook and uh youtube as well but and YouTube. all the all the details if you have a look at the website you'll be able to find your university yeah. stories on there yeah and, well, and thank please- you yeah thank you so much you you've been such a gracious guest um I'm, 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 i love meeting new people and and finding like-minded people um even if we are across the world from each other well as they say across the pond um <laughs> it's like you just you just next door so it's been so lovely chatting to you and and yeah it feels like you know we're mates um it's been lovely. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. We'll, you. we'll see you on Clubhouse hopefully soon. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. And um, thanks for watching. Um, next uh, Wednesday is the Q&A. Following on from this session, we're going to just unpack ADHD a little bit more. Chatting about dyslexia and ADHD Wednesday, 8 p.m. So watch, uh, tune in there. But other than that, um, thanks again for watching and stay safe. Good evening.